Originally, I named this session uh, Leadership Based on Life, Knowledge, and Wisdom. And when Andres came, I added the spiritual, uh, which is kind of redundant to me, in a sense. Uh, uh, Andres said that uh, the future of enterprise lies in values and vision, which I think is a very powerful statement. I spent from a year researching very successful business organizations over a period of 100 years. And I would say the, the, the real long-term success of enterprises has always depended on values and vision. And if you look historically, 95% or 98% of enterprises come up for a while, they do something, they make something or lose something, and then they disappear. In the U.S., the figures are something like 80% of new businesses fail within the first five years, and 80% of the rest fail within the next five, uh, which pretty much means, in my experience, they don't have the values and visions. And if you see an organization that's really lasted for a long time and transformed itself, not once, but many times as the society changes, it's because they already knew this. So I made a comment a few days ago, sounds, seems like weeks ago when we got here, but, uh, and Bowden mentioned it again, uh, when I said that uh, I think of values not as some lofty, ideal, unapproachable ideals, but as the quintessence of wisdom, pragmatic wisdom for sustained success in life. Of course, we know many people succeed in the very opposite principle for short periods of time. If you call making money or getting rich uh, or driving other people out of the marketplace success, by that definition, they succeed. But I think you'd be hard pressed to find many examples of long-term sustained success that are not based on uh, core values doesn't mean anyone's perfect, and in some areas we may be strong and others weak. My idea for this last session was just to share with you a few uh, essential lessons that I've learned about leadership or learned from other people, not just from uh, many other leaders and studying them uh, historically and biography. Uh, a lot of them we've already talked about, others of you have mentioned, so I'm going to go through it quickly and only comment where I think there's something that uh, needs further repetition. Uh, I mentioned this yesterday or the day before under the idea of the mind of the leader, but it's, to me it's such a profound truth. There's always truth in another person's point of view even when you know that they're attacking you with ill will, when their one intention is to, uh, to undermine you, uh, uh, there's always a truth. And to be able to learn from whatever that truth is, doesn't mean we believe everything everybody said, but to learn why, what's that truth, to me is a profoundly valuable insight into effective leaders. And I guess that's the rationale uh, why uh, Abraham Lincoln said he likes to have his enemies where he can see them in the cabinet. Mm. Uh, at least he was constantly hearing those truths with what, through whatever distortion they were presented. And uh, uh, I think the, mo the most power, most difficult thing and the most important thing that we do in life is to take decisions. Uh, taking decisions, delaying things, going in a half-hearted way, letting life push us around is one thing. But to take decisions and to really be committed to those decisions is extremely difficult. It's exhausting. Uh, if you wake up and take a decision, it's time to go back to bed for a week because the very the act of taking the decision absorbs so much energy. And I mentioned a number of examples here which I'm not going to go through. I'd already mentioned Churchill. Uh, but I think if you look at uh, successful leadership, there are points at which uh, the leader takes a decision and fully gets committed behind it. And failures of leadership are very usually the case where uh, a refusal to be decisive. Uh, 
and I, I mentioned this earlier, success is not simply a matter of doing the right thing. It's a matter of doing certainly the right thing as far as we believe we know what is right. We never have all the information and we may be. But it's to do it with total conviction, faith, commitment, and determination. Uh, again, this is something we've already discussed. Uh, to look at things that appear to be contradictions, that I want, I think this should be done, somebody else thinks the opposite should be done, and to look at them not something we have to compromise on, but to try to find something at a higher level, a deeper level, some place where these things are reconciled. Uh, I think it's a profound uh, truth of effective leadership. Uh, and uh, Ivo and I wrote an article on undiscovered genius, which I mentioned, in which we talked about how the great scientific discoveries were able to unify apparently unconnected or, or uh, contradictory phenomenon. Uh, that's at the physical level. In life, I think the same thing is true. And I mentioned Lincoln reconciling freedom and unity during the Civil War as an example. Uh, uh, Alexander mentioned uh, 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 synchronicity uh, and uh, 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 and um, and serendipity. Uh, and this is a, a version of that. Uh, I was talking earlier about the importance in leadership of recognizing that the end result doesn't just depend on the objective reality, it depends on the subjective reality, it very much depends on uh, what's going on inside ourselves. And I would say if one of the essences of spiritual leadership is to understand whatever is going on around us has a correspondence with us. And when people come up and challenge uh, my opinions, my views, my convictions, uh, if I scratch the surface, I will see I've got all the same doubts uh, myself, and they're only expressing what I'm trying to uh, deny or avoid. Uh, and I think the, if the leader who recognizes that the outer is a reflection of uh, the inner, and that also means that the attitude we take, the conviction, we have inside has a tremendous power outside. To me, that's pragmatic uh, wisdom in life for leadership. Uh, uh, if you look at people who have achieved at a high level, uh, one of the characteristics is invariably, whether it's a company, a country, or an individual, intense aspiration. We, I was talking about energy on the first day, but I didn't say, where does that energy come from? Uh, the worst uh, enemy of achievement, especially of transformational leadership, is satisfaction. The moment we're satisfied, the moment we're proud, the moment we think we've accomplished something valuable uh, and we can rest on it, as far as I'm concerned, the work is over, we might as well go home. And I've seen that in my own life very uh, uh, painfully, not even when I expressed the satisfaction, but when somebody recognized the work that I did and said, great, we're going to go and implement this, and I had a sense of psychological satisfaction from it, and I saw the next minute the whole thing was over. It never went beyond that. And I reflected on it. How could this be? And I realized when I looked back, uh, with some embarrassment, the truth of the matter was I did this work because I wanted somebody to recognize that it was valuable. Uh, and the moment I got that recognition, it was over. The fact that it could have been implemented, the fact that it could have become a real reality, uh, I never dreamed of that. I was trying to convince somebody that I had a good argument, and now they've agreed with me, work is over. So to me, the greatest enemy of transformational leadership is to be satisfied with uh, what you've done. Uh, this is so well known and has been expressed in so many different ways in the last four years that it doesn't need any explanation, but I think it's worthy of repetition of how powerfully our attitudes determine the results we get. Uh, attitudes towards other people, attitudes towards the work, attitudes towards ourselves, uh, attitudes towards what's possible. And the hidden 
discussion that's constantly going on in our work on the new paradigm is, do we really believe this is possible? Uh, in fact, that's why we frame this ridiculous question, is there any way to solve all our problems? Because if you scratch the surface, most people, we just go on because we, we really don't think there is a way. We, we hope there's a way. We hope that we're going to get through. So working on our attitudes, being conscious of our attitudes, and my definition of a positive attitude is it's something that opens the gates and lets us move forward. And the more, a negative attitude is something that says stop here because there's no way forward. Uh, and sure enough, wherever there's a negative attitude, I can't work with this person. Uh, I can't, this thing I cannot do. Uh, it stops there. So there's no question of achieving more. Uh, I think I alluded to this also, either here or in uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, the power of personal attention, and that's what I was really hearing from Philip and Pierre in their wonderful experience, which they only gave us a little of here, but uh, they have so much more to, to share. But one power we always have, which we can't be robbed of, but we use to a very small extent, the power of just giving personal attention. We can call it consciousness, call it concentration, call it energy, call it goodwill, it doesn't really matter. But I think they have developed a methodology where they recognize just the power of saying your ideas are important, your feelings are important. And this just brings out so much from people. Imagine an organization, imagine a leader who's not thinking about himself and how important he is, but thinking about how much he can release that potential from others. Certainly that is transformation. You have, both of you and Andras have talked so much about giving and all. Because I deal with business audiences, I'm even a little shy of even putting this uh, uh, slide up often. But there was a wonderful book written last year, I think it was, called Give and Take, in which, quote, scientific research. I mean, it was statistical scientific research, but we feel so happy when we can say, I've got scientific evidence for something which is so self-evident to anybody who just simply wants to observe. But anyway, the scientific data, which I won't present now, uh, from a large number of successful individuals and cases shows the effectiveness of people who give without even thought of a return, certainly without calculating the return, but even if they know the principle uh, out of the motive. So as a pragmatic principle, it's far too powerful to leave it out, even if it sounds uh, uh, just uh, uh, idealistic. And I think when you look at uh, the lives of very successful leaders, like we heard of a fantastic story yesterday uh, uh, from Alexander. I think clearly, uh, if you're thinking about money, if you're thinking about fame, if you're thinking about popularity, if you're thinking about power, it, it ends there. And giving means you're not thinking about those things. You're thinking about uh, what needs to be done. Uh, this is, uh, to me, a really powerful idea, not because religion teaches it, but because I have learned in principle how uh, uh, important it is. And fortunately, I don't have to talk from personal experience. There was a, a very well-known scientific management study done about 10 years ago. Some of you may know good, good to great uh, by Jim Collins, where they went into top companies. And one of the most striking Su surprising conclusions they came to from their study was they expected to find big macho people at the head of the most successful organizations. Mm -hmm. And the people they found typically at the head of very successful organizations were, were really quite humble. And the first time I went into very successful corporations like Coke and Northwestern Mutual, which is a top life insurance, Delta Airlines, when it was at the top of the industry, I found the same thing. And at frankly, I was disappointed. Mm -hmm. You know, where are these big heroes that I came to see? I mean, this guy was on the face of Fortune, the cover of Fortune magazine, and, uh, and Merck is the most admired corporation in America. Uh, and I missed the whole thing. Uh, 
uh, for a long time. And then I realized that that was not an, an accident. Uh, that was the truth behind it. A really effective organizations have leaders who know how to bring out the best in others rather than those who are trying to uh, assert themselves and run uh, the show. This is something I've learned from practical experience, and I just cited one uh, example from Steve Jobs. When you can't do anything, when a situation is impossible and we seem to be back to the wall, I found there's always something you can do. And if you do what you can do, even if it's simply clean the floors, and I've tried that in a company that was on, in bankruptcy and it worked also, uh, but uh, if there's nothing else you can do, do what you can do, and it'll create some degrees of freedom uh, that can be very effective. The example I gave was when Steve Jobs took over Pixar, uh, which was, uh, what's his name, uh, Lucas, George Lucas had built Pixar because he wanted to sell at computer animation uh, hardware and software to the motion picture industry. He was, a most, of course, a, uh, a special effects expert with Star Wars. And uh, it, the company fa was failing, and he sold it to Steve Jobs for $7 million. And Steve had the same idea, I'm going to make great computers which can do all of these things, and found out shortly that there's really no market for $35,000 uh, desk computers with animation software beyond selling them to Disney, which you can sell them at $100,000. But he thought everybody would be making their special effects at home. And the company was going bankrupt. They had to cut staff. They had to cut production almost to zero. And along came some guy, I forget his name now, but he's very famous. Somebody may know. They had a department in this company. They had a department in this company which made short films to illustrate how their hardware and their software worked. And at a time when it was cutting back and they were bleeding cash, this guy who headed the department, Lassiter was his name, John Lassiter, he came and said, look, I need a quarter of a million dollars to make a three-minute uh, animated computer video uh, about toys that talk. And Steve took a look at the idea and he said, all right, well, we can't do anything else. We'll do this. It's not even the business they're in. They're in the computer business. And he came up with this. And this little three-minute video won the Academy Award. It was the first uh, computer animated uh, special effects video uh, to receive an Academy Award. And along came Disney and said, we'll buy the rights to this. And we'll make it into a motion picture, which was, uh, which was Toy Story, the first Toy Story story. Uh, and then from there, Pixar went on, and Steve Jobs, who bought the company for $7 million, sold it to Disney eventually, it was about 15 years later, for $7 billion. <laughs> this was the token thing that he could do. Uh, Andra started us in silence, uh, and I, I quote, from great leaders and people with great insight. Nothing that enhances authority more than the power to keep silent. And it's very difficult. Uh, it's very difficult to keep silent. It takes a tremendous strength not to express ourselves, not to express our opinion. And I go beyond that because silence we take as non-speaking, absence of verbal uh, but that's only the outer part of it. There are several other layers to it which are even much more difficult. Uh, but the magic, when you master it, it's very easy. Well, uh, I'd like to learn from you, and you'll be my master then, because uh, I find that uh, no matter how much I do it, it's difficult. More valuable than not expressing is when you don't express what you think should be done or what you want to be done. And I think for effective leadership, this is really critical. Because the moment it's come in nature, the moment somebody says, let's do this, hey, why don't we go out to this restaurant for lunch, or let's have Chinese, or let's have Italian, I immediately I begin to think, do I really want Italian? What about the Mexican or something else? Human nature is the moment somebody presents their will, presents their preference, presents their opinion, it kind of invariably evokes 
a, 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 an alternative. Do, is this really what I want to do? Why should I follow his opinion? And I think effective leaders have learned that when you don't express that opinion, I've got great stories, but no time to tell them. When you don't express the opinion, and you let a group come out, uh, very, very often, I can't say it's invariable, but very, very often, the very thing you thought should be done comes from the group. And the great advantage of it is that when it comes from the group, there's no ego in it. They're not resisting anything. They think it's theirs. They, it is theirs. Uh, and they own it because it's come from them. And I heard a lot of that in your, uh, uh, your presentations. And I found that it really is a, a, a very good uh, help. Uh, going beyond what I call silence and silent will, something much more difficult than if you can, if I can do this once in a while, I congratulate myself. But not reacting when people, when situation is provoking, when it's disturbing, and there are lots of things that disturb us. I have not yet found an instance in which my getting disturbed has helped me accomplish anything. But I have a long list of examples of when I've gotten disturbed, whether I've expressed it or simply felt it, uh, when it, uh, it prevented me from accomplishing something. And I've seen, uh, this, is a, this is directly a spiritual uh, principle. In, in Sanskrit, they have a word, samata, which means equality. So I put the second word, equality means to us uh, something else. But that is the capacity not to be disturbed to be equal in, in that sense. Uh, and uh, it's a, a tremendous power. And we have a school. We, there are a lot of things we try to do, a lot of things we haven't attempted to do. But I believe this knowledge, you can't give a person the power to do it. It has to come from a maturity. But you can give the people the knowledge, even at a young age. Uh, and we, I've seen young children who understand this. That my being angry, my being disturbed is not going to help. Uh, and then when you know it's not going to help, and when you begin to see the consequences of it, you certainly learn to acquire that capacity uh, at a younger age. And I'm sorry it took me so long to learn. I, somebody had told me about it much uh, earlier. And then I'm going to end just with this one. And this is, uh, you can go back to the to Lao Tse for this. It, you want. But sometimes the most powerful thing we can do is not to do something. Not because we're afraid of doing something, but because the urge to act is so powerful that it's uncontrollable. And the thing that's more powerful than acting with an uncontrollable urge is controlling the urge. And uh, no stories, nothing, but if you ever uh, 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 want to try something that's really difficult is try taking an irresistible urge and I'm not going to express it, I'm not going to do it, and see what happens. Uh, and uh, I'd be happy if you share your experiences with me one way or the other. Mm -hmm. And I think I already alluded to this, this is the last slide. Uh, uh, for any act, leaders are acting all the time, action is where is what's powerful. For any act to be really complete and give the full results, there are three requirements. Obviously, we've got to have clarity of knowledge, which will never be complete. Whether it's complete or not, it's going to depend on the conviction and determination. OK, this is what I know, but based on my best knowledge, I'm going to put my full uh, conviction behind it. Emotionally, to release the energy and enthusiasm behind the act. We've been talking about it, a number of people have. And finally, to have the patience to express it with the positive attitudes and skills to the end. Uh, whenever I look at acts which have failed, uh, it's pretty easy to see. Either I didn't have that clarity, or I didn't really have the conviction, or it didn't release my emotions or I really didn't do it with the skill, patience, or positive attitudes required. Thank you. I know that uh, in five minutes we are going to close this because a, num a number of you have a flight to catch. So five minutes, and then I just want one last word. 
uh, to close the session. Anybody for the yeah. uh, Thank you so much. Dream uh, to, uh, to enjoy such a presentation a couple of years ago that has been so helpful. I believe we intend to, to to act as a spiritual company. My my comments is with this with this well. When I was a young child, one time my mother told me, you know, Delta, I was so sad when I gave birth to you. Because I knew that some of the time you would be going to die. And the act of giving birth is also killing all the other opportunities. And decision making in whereas we are a collaborative company, whereas etc., is always an act that is done in the duality. Giving a shape, giving a form, taking a decision is always giving a direction and so keeping all the other ones. And it's very difficult. That was my, my point with that we are decision making. The other one, being a spiritual company, the, the very first act of management that we had to take care of with the tree we were at was to exclude someone. We were so young. Uh, the, the foundation was alive just a couple of months ago for me. All we had to face the issue of having to go out. And who are we to judge the spiritual path of another? Who are we to assess the quality of a person? That really made us, uh, and I particularly, uh, awake at night for days. And we've done what we had to do. And in the end, we had a great revelation in life. Finally, he told us that he was definitely a narcissistic manipulator and that he had a lot of people before us. So, these two examples, uh, I just want to emphasize that actually it is more complex uh, acting as a spiritual company. It requires not only the normal skills, but additional ones. It is still a normal company acting in the samsara, acting in humanity, uh, making birth a death. Um, but so far, I I'm fully happy, and I believe we have an amazing team, and there is absolutely no regret. Top journalism. I'd like to really thank all of you on behalf of the Academy World University Consortium. I'd like to thank all of you for one word. I, I know what that is. One word. Um, literally, yes. May, may I have one word? What, what, what is the phrase you hear most when business people, when you talk to business people and you hear an offer? He said, what's in it for me? That's the most common mantra. So if we are uh, able to transcend that and to reverse that, it would be a great walk forward. Okay. Just like to thank you all and all of those who've already left for a great session and all your contributions. And we look forward to having you at future programs of the academy. Safe travels.